Hello, welcome to the interview here on France 24. If you're watching this show in a place where democratic elections are a natural part of the political landscape, and I say to you the words election observer, polling station, chances are you know what I'm talking about, or you have a pretty good idea. What if you're in an Arab country just emerging from decades of war, dictatorship, colonial rule, and what if you're tasked with helping to organize that country's first free and open elections? How do you make sure that what you say is what you really mean? Concepts such as ballot tampering or exit poll don't get lost quite literally in translation. Well, that's where my guest today, uh, Philippa Neve, uh, comes into the picture. Welcome to our studios. Thank you. Uh, Philippa, you, starting in Tunisia in 2011, uh, you've been helping Arab countries uh, in transition devise a common electoral vocabulary, if we can call it that, uh, for use throughout the region, whether we're talking Iraq, Yemen, Libya, uh, you name it, um, and basically trying to apply it. And the, the upshot of that effort is a new book. It's a guide. It's a lexicon, the Arabic uh, lexicon on electoral uh, terminology, a long name, but basically it's Arabic, English, and, uh, and French translations of 481 different concepts and, and words. Let's start at the beginning. It was Tunisia, you were telling me just before the show. Uh, you found, you, you came up against a sort of unique uh, problem. They were organizing their first elections there, um, and you were there as an election observer. Tell us what happened. Well, actually, um, it was in 2011, as the preparations were going ahead for the first national uh, constituent assembly elections. And I was part of a team, a United Nations electoral assistance uh, team, actually, and we were uh, helping the newly established uh, election commission, the independent election commission, to organize these elections. And it's a whole new field, of course, in, in that part of the world. And it certainly was in Tunisia because elections were not they didn't know elections. About it. Sure. <laughs> you know, Ben Ali always had sort of 99.8% of the vote, and that was that. And so these, uh, all of these people were brought together to, to organize the elections. And um, we, we, were, we were there to help and we were talking about what's going to happen and how to put into place the procedures and all of these things. And, and I'm an Arabic speaker, so we were communicating in Arabic. And what came up was this word observer, because election observers are a very important part of elections. And we all know what they are in the West, right? Well, election yes, observers. Yes, we do. <laughs> we take them for granted. We take them for granted. And, and what happened there is that the members of the commission were using this Arabic word called mullahis, which is to observe in a sort of passive sort of sense. That's to say, I noticed that he was wearing a blue tie. Did I go and check if the tie was blue or not? That's the role of an election observer. The election observer needs to go and check. So to use a passive word is not a good idea because so, it's misleading. So in this very, very basic concept, the misuse of a word had really significant consequences. They didn't really understand what you were there to do. Well, they didn't really understand the role of the observer. Uh, I think that's more to the point. And because election observation had never happened in Tunisia, so mm. how would they know? Uh, and actually, as we explain things, uh, that these are the things an election observer does, whether it's a domestic observer. There were a lot of domestic uh, civil society organizations very, very keen to get involved in, in domestic observation. And there were many international observation organizations that were very keen to get involved in the first democratic election. So you, ne you needed to communicate here. Now, beyond election observer, there were other basic concepts. Polling station was another one that you sort of had to explain. But I just want to correct me if I'm wrong. This book is really sort of the first attempt, as you describe it, to make sure that across this broad region, where there are different dialects of Arabic being spoken, the words people are using to describe elections and democracy are all understood wherever you are, whichever country you're in. That's right. I mean, you have modern standard Arabic, which the definitions and the terms in, in this lexicon are in modern standard Arabic, which is understood by you know, everybody across the region. It's classical Arabic, right? Uh, it's modern. Classical Arabic usually refers to the older sort of 12th century golden age okay. of literature okay. Arabic. So modern standard Arabic is what, what is in use today in newspapers and magazines and so on. Okay. So, the, and it's also what's used in the United Nations. So let's, let's uh, refer to the United Nations terminology database, for example, that's all in modern standard Arabic. Um, so yes, this, this is a first attempt. We unfortunately couldn't cover the whole of the Middle East region, <laughs> but we did cover eight countries and we harvested uh, the 
terms that are in use in these countries because we don't think it's necessarily important to harmonize it's just important for people to understand each other let me ask you something. We've been talking about very basic concepts. I mean, democracy is in there. Constitution is one of the terms in there. But there are also terms, I was looking through the, the, the lexicon, swing constituency, uh, gender mainstreaming, first past the post system. These are concepts, uh, Philippa, which are sometimes con difficult even for Western people who have been voting in democratic elections all their lives to understand. How do you explain this clearly and accurately to, these, to this region? So we try to use, um, well, of course, international standards. These are all terms that exist that are out there. So our objective was to uh, describe what these things mean in very concise, clear terms. And it's actually a knowledge tool. So this helps people understand what these things are. They're not necessarily first past the post is a system generally used in the, in the UK. Right. It's not used really elsewhere. But it's, uh, it's interesting for people to know it's there. You're not there to, let, let's just be clear, because our viewers might be saying, oh, here's the UN trying to impose its electoral uh, concepts and terminology. This is not some Western observer coming in saying this is the way you do it. It's just introducing the concepts. Yeah, and they are international basic concepts of how a genuine, organ a genuine election is organized. So it's a reference tool. It doesn't mean that all of it is going to be in use. Could, could, um, you give, could you give me an example of a concept? Because let me just remind our viewers, this was a collaborative effort, right? It was representatives from each of the, uh, there are eight countries represented here, sitting around trying to, dis trying to come to terms and agreement on how they should define these words. What was one that really caused dispute? Well, let's go back to polling station. That was a good one because it's mm. so basic. It's, right. it's, it's quite an interesting example. Um, we all think of polling station. We know what a polling station is. That's where we go to vote. Polling stations actually from, comes from the English. You know, in French, they would call polling office bureau de vote. Um, but generally speaking, in Arabic, it was, it was taken up as the, in, as the English term polling station. Hmm. But in plenty of countries, there were other things being in use, as in polling center, polling committee. I mean, there was at least eight or nine different ways. Different it's, nuances. They all meant different things. Yeah. Well, they meant the same thing, actually. And, okay. and that was the problem, because when, the, when you start talking about a polling station, that's where a voter goes to cast their ballot. A polling centre has several polling stations in it. So, uh -huh. is it, so if you start it, using the word polling centre instead of polling station, you could be misleading voters, for example. And this, this is a point that, that, that you make uh, in the introduction here, that the misuse of words in any field, I guess, could have serious consequences. I want to ask you, years ago when I was working in Russia, I remember they were going over to capitalist system of business and they'd use words from English in Russian like money management <laughs> or franchising. They would yes. just take the English word. Yes. Do they do the same thing? Were there times you just said, let them use the English term? We can't think of anything. Certainly. Um, gerrymandering was one of them because mm. actually gerry gerrymandering is a very difficult concept to explain. Can you explain, explain what in, that is? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> fiddling around with constituency boundaries in order to, okay. you know, push the vote in one way or the other. So that, that was a very difficult one. So we thought we'd just, we, we didn't think, it's our colleagues in, in all of these election commissions around, uh, around the six countries in which we worked um, thought, well, let's just keep the English and gerrymandaria in so the Arabic. Actually, yes. And they just Arabicized the word in, it, yeah. in, into. What about the fact that uh, another devil's advocate argument? Great book. It is a start, a first step, as you say. But you're, it's applying to some countries which are in the midst of still sectarian, ethnic, brutal wars and conflicts. Libya comes to mind, for one. This is, this, isn't this sort of like an alien dictionary for them? Well, I think it's nice to, to think and project oneself into the future because hopefully these conflicts are not going to go on forever. And there are also a lot, a lot of people who are not actually involved in the conflict mm. and who do aspire to a future where political and civil rights will be respected and where they will be ex able to exercise their rights to vote. It's an optimistic so, endeavor. Well, it's a knowledge tool that, that, that's put that out there to be used by people who want to, to build a future beyond conflict. And who would you describe as the potential target audience? I know you've said it's, it's potentially very big. Who? Well, to start with, people who are actually organizing the elections. I mean, there are a lot of technical terms in there that are actually directed to people who who are in charge of organizing right. elections first and foremost. But also, you know, newly, newly nascent political parties, civil society groups who want to observe elections, media. People, journalists. <laughs> journalists, okay. yes. Because okay. all of these things are very important to call things by their name so as not to mislead the public, for example, just simply because as a media person, 
you haven't been exposed to these concepts or terms. So I think the audience could be potentially very wide. Here, this is quite high level, let's say. I mean, sure. you know, and perhaps we, we might, we're trying to think of perhaps doing a, a, a more simplified. Um, a For simplified, your average yes, layman. Yes, so to speak. yes. That's something we're talking about with our colleagues in the UN. And finally, um, it is a first step. It has 481 entries. You said there will be, or you hope there will be future editions. You could see this expanding. Well, yes. Beyond. I think we've already had interest from other countries that, were, that didn't participate, other Middle Eastern countries and various mm. other potential partners who are saying, well, why don't we include such a country? Why don't we include the other? And so, absolutely, I mean, all of the, the regional, um, the regional um, office of the UN for the Arab states and also various other election assistance projects in the Middle East region are looking into it. So, so we'll have to leave it there, and perhaps we'll have you back uh, one day when we have a much expanded dictionary <laughs> yeah. of thousands of pages with new electoral terms. Uh, Philip Aniv, uh, thank you very much for being here. You're a uh, UN uh, electoral consultant, and you've helped work on what's really uh, the first attempt to come up with a common electoral language for uh, Arab countries just emerging in their democratic transition, trying to organize elections. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching. The intro here on France 24. Stay tuned for more.